of the children in the Juvenile Justice Center in Alameda County come from Oakland. And 80% of those children are African American, almost exclusively male. We as an organization are pushing children out of our schools and into the justice system. We have to interrupt that. And this board saw fit in June to approve a plan and a direction that framed a position that would be an executive director level role inside of our organization to take primary responsibility for coordinating efforts to interrupt the institutional oppression and racism that is effect, in effect in the city of Oakland. So it is my extraordinary pleasure tonight to introduce to you somebody who will start on Friday as the Executive Director for African American Male Achievement, Mr. Chris Chapman. First of all, it's a pleasure and a privilege to be in front of all of you this evening. Um, I want to thank the leadership of Oakland Unified School District for having the audacity to put forward a framework to deal with the crisis of African American boys in this city. But now to unequivocally align resources, people, and program in a way where there's an unapologetic, intentional effort to uplift, engage, and empower black males. It is a pleasure and a privilege to serve you all, and I look forward to, to talking to the youth, talking to my peers, and talking to my elders as we change the trajectory of black youth in the city of Oakland. Because the reality is, um, I mean, you know, I'm the man I am today in the spirit of, man, 19 years married, three sons, being able to do what I do, but it's because I've had access to extraordinary brothers, man, that in my vulnerability to say, man, I don't know what to do. My kings give that back to me. I think my uh, brothers give that back to me and I'm able to give it right back to them. Um, and it allows me then to step into places and spaces and stand in my truth. I was born in Daly City, uh, California, on the other side of the bay. I was actually put up for adoption. I was shepherd to Catholic Charities Organization, where I was there, from what I understand, about eight months, I guess what you would call an orphanage, uh, until my mom and my dad adopted me, and then grew up in South San Francisco. Mom, strong-willed, African-American woman. Her, her roots were Oklahoma, then they moved to Oakland. Graduated from Castlemont High School, and then she ended up being an elementary school teacher for 35 years. My mom and my dad divorced when I was like seven. That was definitely a, a difficult time period. Dad, oh man, just, I mean, literally just an angel, an amazing human being in terms of his ability to really just kind of feel your pain or feel your situation to the degree that he would almost take on whatever it is that you were that made you, allowed the, the person who was talking to feel good and feel better. He got hurt on the job, you know, as, I mean, I must have been like six or seven in the hospital for a year. And then when he finally kind of came out, I remember my parents being divorced and then not seeing him for a minute. And then um, he had a little studio and uh, I just you know, couldn't wait to weekends to go visit my dad. And, um, and I have a little brother too, Brian, um, uh, you know, my mom and dad's biological son. You know, I, I tell you though, the thing where brought me peace of mind around just the fact of being adopted actually came around junior, senior year of high school. My baseball coach gave me a perspective of, you know, you had two parents that loved you enough to, to realize they couldn't take care of you, so they let you go, knowing and trusting two parents would come 
and pick you and love you as their own. And when I heard that, I was like, hey, you know, and so peace of mind. And so really my, my worst memories were school. In kindergarten and first grade, um, associated school just getting, you know, hit by my teacher. In those days, they literally would have a paddle right adjacent to the door that you would come in and teachers could hit you for just getting up, for talking. And I felt the teachers didn't understand me and so the way that they really would try to get me to sit down and stay quiet and stay silent was to whoop me. You know, it was like trying to break my spirit. And the climax was third grade when um, you know, uh, my classroom teacher put my desk in the coat closet. And so, you know, when she would start the lesson, I would go literally open the door, remove the coats off my desk and sit in my desk. And if I was talking or if she wasn't feeling me, she would just close the door. And my desk remained in the coat closet until back to school night. And I'll never forget my mom coming in at back to school night and asking me, I was the parents sit in your desk, like, well, where's your desk, son? And I um, went to the uh, coat closet and I was like, this is my desk. And my mom was like, you know, son, go outside for a minute. I'm gonna have a conversation with your teacher. And um, you know, needless to say, after that, my desk was no longer in a coat closet. In high school, ninth and 10th grade struggled where you know, my counselor was like, you, know, you really don't belong here. And them really encouraging me to go to an alternative high school. I just didn't associate school with a place that I felt um, proud, I felt smart, I always felt um, that, yeah, like I didn't fit in or people didn't understand me. Every summer, I would go away to this camp called Camp Mendocino. This was Boys and Girls Club camp, and where I learned how to shoot a 22 rifle, you know, archery, I was a master archer, canoeing, uh, learning the outdoors, all these different things. But it was there where I really felt, man, like at my best. I learned, I grew, I got like ama all these amazing awards. But the summer from 10th grade to 11th grade, I actually got the highest award. They only give two out a year, and it was called the gold, this Gold C. When I got that award, I came back out of that summer, and then actually, went into playing basketball, went into playing baseball, and went from a 1.5, 1.3 GPA. So I busted junior year like a 3.5, uh, senior year 3.25. But it was a big shift. I mean, that outside experience definitely gave me the steam that, and taught, you know, what I believe to myself, like really the only thing that's stopping me is me. These workshops are gonna be 20 to 25 minutes long. Culture, to save ourselves, we must save them, you must save us, but we must save you. Given what I experienced at camp, which was transformational, I'm like, this is how school should be. <laughs> you know, you know, the kinds of relationships, the things that we're doing, the way that we're learning, you know, the singing songs and the rituals and the brotherhood and all the different things. I was like, why couldn't school be like this? Having brothers um, that never allowed me to give up, having black men in my life when I had all of these critical stages, it created in me this desire and will to like me, I want to give that back. I have to give that back. And actually the commitment I made to myself when I graduated from high school was to come back and be an extraordinary teacher. The type of teacher that then had kids who look like me, um, who are black and brown, would have an amazing experience. Because really what I'm doing is what I'm, and I, as I told Tony when he invited me to breakfast and told me that he got approved by the school board to have a department for African-American males, he asked me, is this something you'd be interested in doing? And I was like, look, we had did the first man up conference before I actually got this position. But he knew of my work with the Y, he knew of my work with the kids. So when we had this kind of then meeting to talk, Man, it was mad synergy. Now I have three sons, and I'm seeing how they have been received in pub public schools. And I feel like on that level, it was fate. I said, I'd be a great asset to your team. And he didn't have a blueprint. He just was like, look, man, everything that you're doing out there, bring it in. Written and video? Uh, I was thinking more group discussion, but then I was just trying to figure out logistics-wise mm. how we would be able to do that. Chris, is, that's just my brother. We just, there's a brotherhood spirit we have. I think. Um, you can tell who's genuine, who's authentic in this work and, and just as a human being. So it was, you know, organic that way. So look, part of being the brotherhood is there was a distinction. And at some point in your life, in order to be extraordinary, you can't just be kicking it with ordinary cats. So African-American Male Achievement is really the strategic initiative to address the structural racism that is feeding a whole different system. And that's the school to prison pipeline. Manhood development is one of many different strategies. Um, it's kind of been nationally spotlighted as, as the strategy, but it's just, it's one of many different strategies to treat this system.
Where we really met was then when we went to Brown University to get our master's degree in education. And so we were destined to either really like each other or not like each other. We were the only two black folks out of 72 graduate students in education. Yeah. Which kind of seems crazy right now, but right, only two. I should probably start by saying um, that I am enormously proud of my husband. And I think we talked a bunch, actually, before, before it was officially um, offered to him about what this would allow him to kind of take the work to the next level, really be able to focus in on something that I think he's cared about his entire life, which is the well, the well-being um, and success of, of African American children and, and boys in particular. Um, and so that didn't feel like a surprise. It felt like a natural evolution. When you're working in community, this is the part um, of the work that you only talk about like behind your own door, right? It's a challenge. This work takes incredible um, commitment and, um, and, and time, but not just time, I mean, I, I mean energy, right? When Chris accepted the role, we accepted this together, understanding that this wasn't a nine to five, right? Neither of us have kind of lived our lives in those kinds of, those kinds of professions. So it means we kind of have to be available. We're living in Crocker Highlands. We're a middle-class family. My boys have way more than Chris and I were, were raised with, and I still get up every day with a prayer about their safety when they walk out of our house. The work that AMA is doing has the potential to transform how we think about educating black children, period. I think the sky is the limit. I think we're building the next generation of revolutionaries, of teachers, of principals, of city council members. We'll continue to push hard on policy and continue to engage with the different adults and you know, the different sectors, but for me, the truth actually is engaging youth. I'm so excited um, and think that even what I envisioned, it would fall short from what our students are capable of. Who are you? I'm a king, and you? A king maker, the A-A-M-A way, live in the bay. Welcome to a world, come see what's good. It's deeper than a class, it's really a brotherhood. Who are you? I'm a king, and you? A king maker, the A-A-M-A way, live in the bay. Welcome to a world, come see what's good. It's deeper than a class, it's really a brotherhood. Come and take a seat, it's a class with a pass.